Hello, lovelies. You're listening to episode 68 of the Broken Enchantments podcast, written and read by Elizabeth Wheatley. That's me. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Be sure to check out my Patreon for next week's episode now available. You can check out the links below. Happy listening. Sometime towards the evening, Janir was startled awake by the heavy tramp of boots. She jolted upright, disoriented for a moment. Cerulius stopped a few sword lengths from the foot of her bed. He jerked his chin toward the door. The Lord Ergatolum commands your presence. Janir's heart leapt into her throat, and she suddenly couldn't move. Cerulius grasped her arm, bodily dragging her off the bed. Come on. He stopped just long enough to make her put a pair of slippers on. Canicade was waiting outside for them with a third Argatolum Janair had never met before. They tramped back through the twisting halls of the temple, and four of them came to a stop in front of a dark wood door. The dark mahogany writhed with twisting, looping figures of Tethansian mythology. The brass handle turned easily under Canicade's hand, and the door swung open. Even if Janir hadn't felt her father's presence pressing down on her like a smog, the honor guards outside were warning enough. Her escorts shut the door behind them, then took up posts on the inside of the entry, blocking her escape. Janir stared at the tiles. As Cerulius cast her a cold, uncaring glare, she couldn't help but think of how he had been back in Valmachen. How he had looked out for her, protected her, he had even held her while she cried once. The Lord Argotalum was an inky shadow in the corner of her eye, darker and more solid with each passing moment. Aren't you going to look at me, Janair? She cringed at his voice, his rich, beautiful, terrible voice. She squeezed her eyes shut. Arms rigid at her sides, she tried to make herself look up. It would be far worse if Cerulius had to force her. Still, she couldn't seem to do it. Standing as stock still as a granite statue, she focused on breathing. I... I know I have no right to ask anything of you, but I lost you the war, not Savin, Carile, or the others. Janir's fingernails ground into her palms. The Lord Argatalum had ordered Savin tortured before. There was no telling what would be done to him or the others now. Look at me, Janir the Lord Argatolum commanded. It was useless to disobey. Janair pried her eyes open and beheld the man she feared most in the world. The Lord Argatolum lounged in a silken chair with his feet propped up on a footstool. His elbows rested on the chair's armrests and his hands were steepled before him. Janair had expected anger. She had betrayed him and the entire Argatolum race. The absence of frothing fury or any clear feeling, frightened her more. They were in a study, walls lined with shelves of scrolls and bound manuscripts that were thankfully well dusted. Light streamed in from an airy window that faced south. An opulent carpet graced the floor, and armored honor guards lurked behind the Lord Argatolum. The Mortons and Mortanas stood like granite pillars, ready to spring to life in an instant. How much of your memory has returned? The Lord Argatolum sounded almost conversational. Janir gulped. What do you want with me? I will ask the questions. Janir took a deep breath. She shifted, unable to find a comfortable stance. More comes back every day? Her memories were not returning in order or very quickly, but she was still making progress. She wasn't sure if it had been wise or foolish to confess that to her father, but she would learn soon enough. Hmm. The Lord Argatolum's brows rose slightly as he considered something. Now what do you want with me? Making sure to keep even a hint of defiance out of her voice. He didn't reprimand her this time. Firstly, did you kill Canistrith? 
Fear gripped Janir's heart. Yes, she replied. There was no point in lying. He already knew the truth, she was sure. Canistrath had been her father's sister, his only full-blooded sibling. She was the only family he'd had left from his childhood. The Lord Argatolum tilted his head to one side. After a moment, he asked, Why? She attacked me. Janir's throat constricted, but she forced out the words. I was trying to free Saevan, and she wouldn't let me. The Lord Argatolum studied her. She attacked you? Yes. So it was self-defense? There seemed to be a challenge in that. A dare. Janir gulped. Yes. The Lord Argatolum studied her for a long moment. I believe you. You believe a traitor? A voice shrieked from the back of the room. From behind Janir's father stormed Amilla, her cousin and Canistrith's daughter. Amilla paced to the Lord Argatolum's side, fury and loathing rolling off her like a maelstrom. My lord, she betrayed all of us. She sided with our enemies. Her word is worth nothing. Amilla stopped a few paces from the Lord Argatolum's chair. The Lord Argatolum did not even move to acknowledge her. Mortana Drusilla. The Lord Argatolum calmly looked to a familiar warrior near the door. Would you be so kind as to escort Mortana Amilla from the room? Amilla flinched as if he had struck her. A moment later, Drusilla stepped forward. The Mortana was a picture of terrifying beauty in her fitted Morsane hide armor, ebony braid tumbling down her back. She paid Janir no heed as she moved toward the younger Mortana. Amilla shoved away the other woman and stormed out of the room, shoving by Cerulius. The door slammed, and it was a long time before Amilla's stomping faded down the hall. As I was saying, the Lord Argatolum continued, no more affected by his niece's outburst than a whisper of the wind. Instead of returning to the back of the room, Drusilla took up a post behind the Lord Argatolum's seat. Dark eyes fixed Janir in a hard stare. Drusilla looked fearsome as a tigress, standing over her master in anticipation of a command. I assume you and your elvish swain had something to do with Canistrit's fate. I assume your elvish swain had something to do with Canistrit's fate. The Lord Argatolum clasped and unclasped his hands. Janir pushed her tongue against the roof of her mouth. No. No, he didn't. She croaked, words sticking to her throat. Said the girl who's in love with him. Think about it, Janir pleaded, after what Amilla had done to him. Do you really believe he could have fought in Volmachen? The Lord Argatolum gave no response. He had probably never believed Saevan killed his sister anyway. Janir swallowed. She was terrified. Terrified beyond words, and not only for herself. Please, please keep the others out of this. It was me. Her voice faltered. Janir began to tremble remembering the pain at Canistrith's Carcotton, imagining just how much worse it would be at her father's. Such a faithful heart you have, my child. The Lord Argatolum rose. He crossed the room to a carafe of wine and several silver goblets set out on a tray. Easily, as though he were in his private dining hall in Adasha, the Lord Argatolum poured into one of the goblets. He swirled the contents for a moment before sampling it. Janir shifted and looked away from him. It's a pity, really, the Lord Argatolum remarked. Janir whirled back to the warlord before her. Why is that? Her voice was soft, weak. Because I know that there is no future for Saevan Kamlin and Janir Kaers and Argatolum. Not the kind you want in any event. Janir swallowed. Just because her father said it certainly didn't mean it was true. The Lord Argatolum glanced up, as though he had heard her thoughts. What? Did you think that the two of you could dance into the sunset and live in peace hereafter? He scoffed. 
It will never happen. What did he stand to gain by taunting her about this now? There have been mortals wedded to elves before, Janir weakly answered. Her father's eyebrows shot up. Firstly, you are an Argotolum. I will languish in the lake of fire before I see one of my offspring bound in wedlock. Janir was fairly certain her father was already headed that way. And the residents of the Sylvan forests would hardly approve, nor will the Brevian High Lords, a half elf Argotolum. They would kill you both first. Janir tried to conceal her hurt. She had thought of that before, all of it, but she had never admitted it to anyone, not even hinted it to Sayavan. The truth was, she didn't often expect to grow old. Most days, she thought she'd be slain in some way or another, long before that became an issue. Putting all that aside, your elf, with all his morals and beliefs, would never take you as a woman. Janir's teeth ground together from a mixture of anger and humiliation. This was absolutely none of her father's business. Death seems a hefty price for consummation. Janir's heart lurched. What? She squeaked. That one word was all she could manage. Oh, you didn't know. The Lord Argotolum began to pace across the room, taking one deliberate step at a time. It turns out, elves must take the lifespan of their lovers. Do you truly believe he will give up hundreds of years for you? Janir looked away. What about the Constancy Star? Saevan had told her that was a symbol of devotion. He had endured hell for her. The least she could do was trust him in this. Though she wondered what kind of selfish woman would ask a man to die to be with her. I'll believe it when Saevan tells me. Her voice quavered. Now what do you want? I want you to return to Adasha and fill your duty to the race of Argotolum. Why? Why go through so much trouble for my sake when you could just kill me and have Lucan take my place? The Lord Argotolum quirked one brow. He must not appreciate her tone. Would you prefer that? Janir hesitated, realizing she had been brash. I have several reasons, Janir. In exchange for your cooperation, I am willing to spare your companions. Even that bastard Kaerson. Drusilla remained unmoving in the same place she had occupied all along, watching the conversation between father and daughter. No one else reacted either. Several people stood at the back of the room, but they were little more than shadows. Every so often, one of them would shift and she would catch the glint of polished leather armor. Janir shook her head. What would you have against Lord Kearson? Aside from the fact that he took my firstborn child and turned her against me, there is the matter of your mother. The Lord Argotolum resumed his pacing, making slow circuits about the room. My mother was your captive. Janir clenched her hands. You took her from her home and her husband and used her as a concubine. The Lord Argotolum was unprovoked. When we took the Brevian capital, the women were divided up with the rest of the spoils. I spared her from a general who would have used her far worse than I ever did. So you are the hero in all this? Janir folded her arms across her chest. Without all this, you would never have been born, the Lord Argotolum retorted. You have gained more power than I or anyone else thought possible. The magic that flows in your blood should be passed on, not spilled and wasted. Janir looked away again. If she ever had children, she prayed that they would grow up safe from their grandfather's clutches and that they would never need to fear him. And she prayed they would be savens. Warm rays of sunlight spilled through the arching window. How wonderful it would be to turn into a bird and fly away. The Lord Argotolum set down his wine goblet. Make no mistake, child, you are a captive. He let those words sink in. 
I merely wanted to give you a chance to have a say in your fate. So, what happens now? Janair closed her eyes and sucked her lower lip between her teeth. Seven, Kyle, Armandius, Velasquez, Luana, and probably Gwenna would all be in mortal danger if this meeting did not go the way her father wanted. The only outcome to satisfy him would be for her to return to Adasha. Returning to Adasha would mean forsaking Kyle, Armandius, and Seovan. Seovan would never dwell in this Daspin waste, especially after what had been done to him while he was an Argatolum captive. Engineer would never ask him to. For him to do that would be to alienate himself from his family, his people, never mind that he would be within her father's reach. Yet the thought of giving up Seovan tore a wound in her heart. But if she didn't agree with her father's demands, if she chose to defy him, he would kill them all. Chenier opened her eyes, determination sealing her decision. You win. The Lord Argatolum straightened. I will do as you wish. I will return with you to Adasha. I will do my best to become the firstborn you and the race of Argatolum expects me to be. Janir's heart sank with each word. She felt as though she were securing her own tombstone. All I want is for you to give me your word, your oath, that Seovan, Carl, Armandius, Kearson, Luana, Velasquez, and Lady Gwenna be allowed to go free and unharmed. The Lord Argatolum cocked his head to one side. He didn't deny that Gwenna was here. You do understand that I expect you to remain at my side in perpetuity. Chenier gulped. Yes. And one more thing. I want your word that you will not seek to harm or imprison any of them after this, nor condone anyone else's attempts to do so. You wish me to spare them permanently. The Lord Argatolum drawled the last word, making it sound exorbitant. I will be joining you permanently. It doesn't sound unreasonable. She fought to stay composed while she died inside. A deal with the Lord Argatolum was not one that could be broken. If she ever went back on this agreement, she knew all too well that he could send assassins after any or all of them. The Lord Argatolum stepped toward her until he was so close Janir could make out the faint red veins in the whites of his eyes. Any attempts on your part to deviate will be met in a likewise manner. Are we clear? Hiding the shudder that went through her, Janir nodded. We're clear. The Lord Argatolum stared her down a moment longer. Once she was thoroughly intimidated, he backed down. Returning to the silver tray and his wine goblet. I have another question, Chenier piped up. When the Lord Argatolum didn't reply, she took a chance and asked it. Why are you here, in Tarkov? Why not intercept us along the way? The Lord Argatolum scoffed. Stop thinking you are at the center of everything, Chenier. You did batter the chalice of Malvern. Indeed, I've been listening to Zamarza complain every day for weeks now. The Chalice of Malvern. The artifact that had nearly allowed the Slavish to conquer Brevia. The artifact that had gone missing after the battle. The artifact Janir hoped for months she had destroyed. Nevertheless, he assures me that it will be battle-ready again very soon. You lied to me, Janir cried. You gave me your word that they would be unharmed. And so they shall be. I will not seek to harm or imprison any of your friends. Our agreement does not, however, extend to Brevia. You deceived. If you finish that sentence, I will have the elf's right eye placed on this tray, are we clear? Janir bit her lip. He was the one with all the power. He always was. Folding his hands behind his back, the Lord Argatolum tilted his head back taking in Tathansia through the window. As soon as the chalice is restored, we will depart. Until then, you may return to your rooms. At that, Cerulius clamped a hand around her upper arm, roughly, like a shepherd wrangling a difficult lamb, 
he hauled her out the door. Janir went without protest. It was as though a brick lodged in her chest, weighing her down, sapping her will. Her father held absolute control. With Sayavan and the others in his power, there was very little he could not make her do. And there was Carile. His powers may not be strong, but he was still an enchanter, and that offered a whole new set of torments the Argotolums could inflict on him. Carile, her best friend. Cerulius dragged her back the way she had come, with the other two Mortons close behind. He never uttered a word, but that was hardly any different from before. The hallways and galleries passed by in a blur. Abruptly, Cerulius shoved her. Janir realized that they had returned to the rooms that were now her gilded cage. Janir darted into the room when she realized tears were coming. She retreated through the door, wanting nothing more than to go to sleep and wake to find all this was a bad dream. She made it just as the first sob racked her body. She collapsed on the nearest couch and buried her face in her hands. This was all too much. She was cursed. There was no other word for it. She was cursed to forever be either hunted or controlled. The circumstances of her birth condemned her to a lifetime of one enslavement or another. Brevia would be invaded again. What was to say everyone she loved wouldn't be killed then? You have been listening to Broken Enchantments, written and read by Elizabeth Wheatley. Don't forget to check out my Patreon for early access to episodes, bonus content, and lots of patrons-only freebies. You can learn more at elizabethwheatley.com. And don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or YouTube. I'll see you next time.